天下人豊臣秀吉の死は束の間の太平を享受していた戦国の世に再び暗雲を招き寄せようとしていた人中の二文字を胸に刻み乱世を生き抜いてきた徳川家康がついに天下を制する好機を得たのである秀吉の意地秀頼の後編と称しながら家康は時代の天下人としての足場固めを半ば公然と行っていた上杉はどうしたまだ上洛せる気か家康は味方となる大名とは婚姻関係を結び敵対する大名は武力で恫喝し服従を誓わせていた豊臣政権下ではお大老の一人であった上杉景勝に対しても謀反の噂に対する釈明という形で心中を迫っていた直江兼次より書状がございました我らに関するつまらぬ噂がナイフ様のお耳に届いているようですが全て愚か者の妄言にすぎません謙信公より受け継ぎし我ら上杉の部門の誇りにかけて妄言の釈明のために上洛するような真似はできませぬナイフ様のように豊臣をないがしろにして天下を伺かがおうなどというつもりは。もうとうございませんしかれども信じていただけぬというのであればぜひに及びませぬもはや我らの間に言葉はいらぬでしょう言葉はいらぬか直江山城の神兼次実に痛快な男よこの不明は久しぶりに血がたぎるわ正信出陣の支度をせよ我ら徳川が天下を滑るための戦起こす気は今ぞこの直江兼次の手紙が世に言う直江城であるこれにより大義名分を得た家康は会津征伐の兵を起こす天下の数勢は家康の思い描く通りに進んでいた Hey everybody, it's Scott,、um, aka Saru,、uh, back again with another video in the Sengoku series.、Um, this one being the third and final chapter of、uh, my series on Tokugawa Ieyasu,、um, the founder of the Tokugawa shogunate, which ruled Japan、uh, for centuries.、Um, the establishment of the Tokugawa shogunate can really be considered the, the end of the Sengoku period because no longer do you have a state of civil war. With all these different separate independent warlords fighting each other,、um, you have power center,、uh, centered in、uh, a shogun again,、uh, whose power is really sort of unquestioned.、Um, you know, there continues to be intrigue and politics and stuff going on, but、um, at, at the very least, there's a central authority at the government uh, level um, with the, the Tokugawa shogun holding ultimate power. Um, so, Ieyasu is considered the third and final great unifier. And I've sort of indicated before in previous, a previous video that I don't really think he's all that great.、Um, there's a proverb that I think I may have mentioned in the previous video that he won、um, by retreating、um, in the sense that instead of making big, risky moves, he kind of was very cautious and patient and waited for opportune times to make his moves. And.、Um, You know, he was kind of more lucky than skilled, I guess, in that regard.、Um, because there were a lot of things that could have gone differently where he wouldn't have had the chances that he had.、Um, but in the end, history is written, written by the winners. So, you know, and, and I don't particularly believe in this whole the great man thesis of history that there are, you know, certain figures like Napoleon Bonaparte's or George Washington's or. Um, you know, Winston Churchill's or Adolf Hitler's, even that you know, history sort of turns on their individual actions. You know, there are larger structures at play, there are、um, average people as well in the consideration.、Um, 
so I think that sort of Ieyasu's sort of mediocrity, I guess, um, in a sort of, a, in a, in a, and I think in a kind of an objective way, you can say he wasn't particularly, you know, gifted other than, again, with patience um, and a fair amount of cunning, I guess. But, um, but his sort of, you know, his, you know, his lack of a sort of, you know, Nobunaga has, uh, you know, his, his huge upset win in 1560. Hideyoshi actually pretty much unifies the rest of Japan and finishes what Nobunaga started with Kyushu and Shinkoku. And Ieyasu kind of just benefits from the fact that Hideyoshi left behind a minor and a bunch of bureaucrats that no one particularly liked, or at least one particular bureaucrat that no one particularly liked. Um, but I think that kind of it challenges that whole great man idea. But anyway, enough rambling from me and commentary. I, let me actually talk about what happened. So um, I started, I played a video at the beginning of this, my actual talking, um, taken from a game um, about what's well, the Nobunaga's Ambition series. And it's about this period, it's set during this period. And it's not a particularly great fun game, but it has nice little cinematics like that. So um, it kind of notes that Hideyoshi dies um, and he leaves behind um, a council of regents to to rule while his uh, his successor, his heir, Hideyori, comes of age, who's a very young child. And you, can, you should be familiar with Hideyoshi's story from my Hideyoshi videos. So... <clears throat> The, the, the people who are on this council are Ieyasu, uh, who's pretty much the most powerful um, one of the bunch because he's got all this land based around uh, you know, the Kanto region. Um, there's Ukede Hidie, who is a foster, who's a relative adopted into the Toyotomi family. Maida Toshie, who is an old friend, an ally of Hideyoshi from way back serving uh, Oda Nobunaga. Uh, you have Mori Teramoto uh, of the famous uh, Mori clan in far uh, western uh, Honshu, the main island of Japan. And uh, Uyasuji uh, Kajikatsu, who is, was the, uh, not necessarily the chosen heir of Kenshin, but the one who won the Civil War after Kenshin died in Ichigo. Um, so <laughs> notably all of these families are loyal, um, specifically those in the Western part of Japan, specifically the Yukida and the Mori, um, and, uh, Meida Toshie is probably the most respected figure out of the bunch due to his also veteran status of being an original, uh, Oda retainer. Um, now, contrary to what you might think, for example, in popular culture, um, it's not that Hideyasu waits a while and is um, in genuine mourning for um, Hideyoshi when he passes. Right out of the gate, he starts marrying off, um, he starts setting up political marriages. And this is a total breach of the agreement that Hideyoshi <laughs> kind of imposed on these, this, these five regions when, uh, before he died. <clears throat> Um, and he, so Ieyasu has political marriages with the Date clan, which is under the famous one-eyed dragon of, uh, of, uh, northeastern Japan, Date Masamune, uh, Fukushima Masanori, and Hachitsuka Munashiga. Um, and again, this is a direct violation of what was agreed before Hideyoshi passed, um, but, you know, other than sort of censoring and rebuking Ieyasu, uh, no one's really willing to go, um, you know, into open conflict with the Ieyasu over this. So it's kind of ignored, even though everyone sort of acknowledges that Ieyasu is breaking, uh, is, is behaving dishonorably, shockingly. Um, now, enter in Mitsunari Ishida, or Ishida, uh, Ishida uh, Mitsunari, to use the Japanese um, surname first, um, given name second. Um who becomes the, you know, if you don't know, you probably do. He becomes the leader of the Western Army, the Toyotomi faction. Um, 
that fights at Sekigahara in 1600, the famous battle that we're going to talk about. Um, and Ieyasu, the, you know, his greatest accomplishment in sort of the way that Margaret Thatcher's greatest accomplishment was creating new labor out of the Labor Party and British politics. Um, Ieyasu's greatest accomplishment, achievement was uh, Ish, uh, Mitsunari uh, really coming to the fore as the main administrator, not a great lord, not a warlord, not a feudal lord in the sense of the societal structure of that time, um, but an administrator, sort of a, a bureaucrat, um, you know, someone who actually does, you know, the running of things. And uh, he is a jerk, basically, and he alienates everybody, even though he is highly valued in the Toyotomi clan structure, he is... Um, he has no like personal skills, and uh, there's a famous in a lot of this alienation of uh, sort of major figures of this time occurs during the Korean War, um, when uh, the Toyotomi Hideyoshi planned to invade China through Korea, um, and Mitsunari, in a true bureaucratic fashion, goes as an inspector general. Which, if you don't know what that means, it's you know someone who reports, you know, investigates waste fraud and, and you know, abuse of authority uh, on behalf of the government. Um, so, like, every every executive agency in the U.S. government has an office of inspector general. I used to work at the Justice Department's um, inspector general's office and, you know, read all the complaints that came in about the FBI and Bureau of Prisons and stuff like that. Um, so Mitsunari is, like, one of these, like, an investigator who goes over there. And, of course... If you're like internal affairs, if you're poking around asking questions, you're going to alienate, um, you know, these really proud uh, feudal lords who are there, you know, leading their their troops. And there was one incident called uh, with uh, I'm sorry with uh, there's an incident with uh, Kuroda Nagamasa in uh, in Korea, where uh, Kuroda Nagamasa was playing Go, uh, which is uh, you know a strategy a game like chess is basically. And uh, he made Mitsunari wait while he finished his game of Go. And Mitsunari was apparently very offended by this and wrote back to Hideyoshi that uh, Nagamasa was more interested in playing, um, you know, games than he was in actually fighting uh, against the Koreans and the, and the Chinese. Um, and there are a lot of other embellishments in popular culture, and I can't really say... For, you know, what entirely is from fact from fiction, um, it's pretty clear that Keito Kiyomasa, Fukushima, uh, Masanori, um, these guys did not like uh, Mitsunari whatsoever. Um, and Mitsunari, out of the gate, um, as soon as, you know, Hideyoshi is dead, he starts plotting against Ieyasu, and there are allegedly plots or uh, attempts on Ieyasu's life. And then uh, there is an actual, a very famous uh, assassination attempt on Mitsunari uh, when he goes to uh, Osaka in 1599 to see Maida uh, Toshie, who's about, he's on his deathbed. Um, and allegedly Fukushima, uh, Kuroda Nagamasa, Ikeda Teuramasa, Asano Yukinaga, uh, Keito Yoshiaki, and Hosokawa Tadayoki. Um, all agree they're all major figures and supporters of Ieyasu or at least opponents of Mitsunari, which is kind of the point I'm trying to make, um, are you know, plotting to kill Mitsunari in Osaka. So Mitsunari apparent, allegedly dresses as a woman and escapes on a palanquin, which is like a litter, like if you, you know, if you are familiar with sort of medieval or feudal customs, you know, the idea of a lord being carried on a um, sort of a pallet. Um, that's what a palanquin pretty much is. So uh, he escapes to Ieyasu's estate, and Ieyasu takes him in. And, you know, you would think, um, if this story was true, which is, you know, dubious, Ieyasu would just kill him, because, okay, here's, like, my major political enemy. Um, he's come to me seeking aid and refuge, um, you know, I've got him uh, on the run from my, my friends and allies. Um, but Ieyasu allegedly protects him and saves his life. Um, so, 
you know, there is kind of this Cold War period where uh, uh, there's clear and in, clear indication that Iyasu is amassing power and influence. But I don't think that there's, an, you know, and there's a clear opposition to Mitsunari as a sort of an alternative to Ayasu. Um, I don't think that there is necessarily opposition to the Toyotomi clan and, and continued uh, unification or the status quo uh, with the Toyotomi at the head. Um, so it may have been indeed true that there were plots against Mitsunari because he was such a jerk and people just wanted to see him gone. Um, I don't know necessarily if it was at such a point where, um, you know, Ieyasu felt so threatened that he needed to bring it to a head if there was, you know, if he did come into, you know, personal ownership of Mitsunari's, you know, physical being. <laughs> so April 1600, this is when William Adams, who, um, in addition to being a the star of a video game called Neo or Nio or something um, out by Koei <laughs> um, was a British uh, sailor. He came over on a Dutch ship that shipwrecked off uh, the Japanese coast. Uh, he was saved, uh, well, pretty much taken prisoner by the local by the locals, um, and you know interrogated for his knowledge of. Um, British technology, or rather just Western technology, Western naval practices. Um, and he rose to become a foreign-born samurai, which were very rare, but did両軍が睨み合いを続けたまま、すでに2時間が経とうとしていた。待たれよ。今日の戦闘は我らが役目。何人たりとも通り抜けるは許さぬぞ。これはお役目ご苦労。我らは松平忠義様のお偉人に備え物見をするだけのことだ案ずるには及ばぬ総大将徳川家康の息子である忠義の為だと言われると揉めるわけにもいかず福島軍も渋々直政の通過を許した鉄砲隊玉込製よよ
秀明の寝返りは予想の範疇であったしかし小早川軍の寝返りがもたらすさらなる変化まではさすがの義次にも見抜けていなかったのであるそう、スプリングの1600年、ウィリアム・アダムスが来て、ウィリアム・スウジ・クラン、ウィリアム・カツカツ、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、ウィリアム・スミリタリー、Sort of censoring them, sort of, you know, are you planning some sort of rebellion or are you, do, are you seeking to disrupt the peace?、Um, and、uh, Naoi Kanetsugu, kind of famously, as indicated in the video,、uh, writes a rejoinder saying, you know, look, we, we, we both know what's going on here, really. This is a political conflict. It's not really about,、um, you know, it's not really about a, a potential rebellion. You know, just as well as I do, that there's going to be a An open conflict between Mitsunari and you.、Um, so Ieyasu quite leisurely goes to、uh, leaves, the, leaves Osaka, goes to, to Edo, his,、uh, his own little capital in, in eastern Japan, in the Kanto,、uh, to build up his own army.、Uh, he sees what's going on.、Um, and then in August of 1600,、uh, Mitsunari goes and starts taking hostages. Um, of families,、uh, of relatives to the, to the lords who are siding with Ieyasu. And this is where we have the famous story of Hosokawa,、uh, Hosokawa uh, Gracia, or Grace,、uh, who was、uh, the wife of Hosokawa Tadeoki,、uh, the Hosokawa being one of the most famous and prestigious families in、uh, feudal Japan. Uh, she had converted to Christianity, and the story goes that because of her Christian beliefs, that she couldn't, you know, rather than go into you know, bondage to uh, Mitsunari, uh, and she couldn't kill herself because suicide is、uh, forbidden in Christianity, she had um, uh, you know, a, a retainer, a, fam-、uh, a samurai who served the ha- that, that particular to the Hasakawa,、uh, stab her. And of course, you know, that's bogus. We, we kind of know that, you know, from Souther and every other source that I've read, that uh, uh, it was common practice that rather than to go into the indignity of, of, of being a prisoner,、um, Tadeoki had given explicit instructions to his retainers to kill、uh, his wife.、Um, and I think there is, the story goes that、uh, it was sort of very dignified, like he. Instead of seeing her face to face, like called her to a screen and killed her through the screen.、Um, so, you know, it's a nice story, the whole the Grace Hasakawa story,、uh, but it's, it's, it's not true.、Um, so, the actual battle takes place、um, at Sekigahara. It's a plain open field, which,、um, you know, Japan is a very mountainous country. It's, Doesn't have very many planes, so Sekihara kind of makes a natural battlefield, if you will.、Um, so Mitsunari deploys there, Ieyasu、uh, encounters his forces there, and、uh, there's a battle. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, famously, what happens is、uh, Hideaki、uh, Kobayakawa. k o b a k a i w a h i d e y a k i in the Japanese you know, fashion, defects、um, from the, the Western Army, from, the, from Mitsunari's army, and uh, attacks uh, Mitsunari and、uh, his forces.、Um, and this, but this only happens after Ieyasu、uh, fires on、uh, Kobayakawa because he's sort of delaying, and a lot of the forces sort of are present that are, are kind of delaying because no one's particularly. Um, super thrilled about Mitsunari's sort of cause in this fight,、uh, except for a few people like、uh, Otani Yoshitsugu, who's a personal friend, a leper、uh, lord who had a personal friendship with Mitsunari and 
the famous uh, tactician uh, Sakon Shima or Shima Sakon, uh, and uh, you know, again, personal retainer of Mitsunari, and again, you know, a lot of pop culture around those figures. But in terms of actual like warlord figures, like the Mori clan should have been, and in technically Mori Teramoto was. Because again, Mitsunari was just a bureaucrat. Mori Teramoto was the head of the Western Army, um, but you know the Mori were not particularly gung ho about fighting for um, Mitsunari's side at Sekigahara. Um, but you know Kobakai was Kobayakawa is the one to know, to actually defect and switch sides. Um, Ashida uh, Mitsunari flees. And is captured, and I'm going to read a little bit from Sadler about uh, his death. Um, when uh, Ishida had been brought to Ieyasu's camp and given medicine and suitable clothes and made comfortable, Honda Masazumi went to see him. After the usual compliments, he began, Since Hideyori is so young, it would have been better if you had done what you could to bring about agreement between uh, the Tairo, which is... Uh, Yayasu and uh, or the the five regents the and the bugyo which would represented the administrators with uh, Mitsunari and so prevent disorder in the empire but instead of that you go and stir up a profitless rebellion like this and stake everything on one battle and lose it that doesn't look particularly wise I wonder what advice or reasons led you to take such a course and this is a great question because you know as I've sort of indicated up to this point Mitsunari you're a jerk no one likes you. Why did you think the people were going to, you know, side with you and that you could win this battle? And Mitsunari says, a secondary vassal like you, ooh, sick, isn't likely to have any ideas about the stability of the empire. You are like a well frog that can't see the ocean, so planning an affair like this and carrying it out would be quite beyond you. Anyhow, it was because uh, Yukita and Yusuji Amori and then uh, Maidageni and Masuda and Nakatsuka could not agree that it all came about, and I can tell you at once that I and nobody else was responsible, so you can tell Ieyasu to take my head off and pardon the others, for they were not the authors of the plot. They did their best, and but when it came to the fighting, some betrayed us, and others were not there in time, and so we failed. But had that not been so, and had they acted in harmony and good faith, it is your side that would have been the losers. But as we have been beaten in our prisoners in your lands, you can criticize us and deride us for being beaten. But even so, in spite of those traitors, Yukita and Otani and Shimazu and I held our ground and fought on without confusion to the very last and never let our defeat become a rout. So whatever abuse is leveled at us, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Um, so he ends up getting beheaded, long story short, is, uh, you know, uh, he kind of gets chastised, like, well, if you saw this was going to, you know, if you knew it was written on the wall, you... Um, you know, why did you take the field if you knew that, you know, one of them was going to betray you? Um, and this is pretty, this is my favorite one, actually. It's, um, Mitsunari is offered a, a person on his way to being beheaded. Um, uh, when he, he stopped and asked for, he asked for a cup of tea. And he refuses the person on the ground that it would injure his digestion. Um, someone says, you know, it hardly seems necessary to worry about your digestion when you're going to get decapitated, decapitated. and then uh, Mitsunari says that shows how little you understand you can never tell how things will turn out the next minute and so while you have breath in your body you have got to take care of yourself which again even though it's probably not true um, the fact that it kind of is acknowledged that you know Mitsunari didn't stand a chance but he kind of went through with it anyway I think kind of sums up Sekigahara, which is kind of anticlimactic and kind of takes a lot of the air out of such a big, famous battle. But um, it's the truth. Um, so Ieyasu becomes Shogun de facto at this point, more or less, but he officially becomes uh, Shogun in 1603 at the age of 60, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so he's crossed the finish line. He gets official recognition from the Emperor. You know, he achieves what Oda Nobunaga uh, may not have even wanted, but didn't achieve what Hideyoshi probably wasn't really qualified for because of his low birth. Uh, he makes it as the unifier, the new supreme authority in Japan. 
And just a mere few years later in 1605, he passes the title to his son, Hidetada, who becomes the next Tokugawa shogun. And uh, Ieyasu becomes the Ogosho, well, a retired um, shogun. Which again is very common if you know anything about feudal Jap Japan or its history. Uh, you know, I've talked in previous videos about emperors who that would retire to the countryside as hermits, but in fact, power would be reigning with them. Um, Hideyoshi was a regent, and then he became the retired regent, the Taiko. Um, so, um, you know, this idea of retiring while still technically being active um, has a very long sort of tradition in Japan at this point. And so in 1609, uh, this is sort of the real official period of, of isolationism. Um, and it's, again, it's just, it's purely good relations with the Dutch East India Company through William Adams at this point. Um, 1614, you get the official Christian expulsion edict, which expelled all the missionaries from Japan. And uh, so in addition to sort of William Adams' influence that I've mentioned, there's also this incident um, with the Madre de Deus, uh, the Mother of God, um, which was a Portuguese trading ship, which um, is attacked by a warlord who actually is a Christian, uh, that is a samurai warlord who is converted to Christianity, Arima uh, Harunobu. Uh, he attacks this Portuguese trading ship, which um, upsets the Portuguese, and then he schemes with another Christian uh, samurai named Okamoto de Hachi uh, to reclaim land that had previously belonged to the Arima clan in uh, Northern Kyushu, uh, Hizen, if I'm not mistaken. And it's reported, you know, reportedly this incident and the fact that these Christian samurai, that is, lo you know, local warlords who were converted to uh, Catholicism, were working together and intriguing together. Um, Ieyasu used that or was, you know, uh, was led to believe by that, that Christianity was a threat to his power, political power. Um, so technically, Ieyasu is shogun, but the Toyotomi clan, clan, Toyotomi clan is still in existence. Hideyori is still a minor, um, or rather, he still is living. He's coming of age. Um, he can assert his claim as successor to Hideyoshi. So even though uh, Ieyasu has the shogunate, his power is not completely um, without challenge. Um, but he doesn't move against Hideyoshi, uh, Hideyori until after the death of uh, Keito Kiyomasa in 1611. Um, and you had other figures uh, like uh, Kiyomasa's contemporary, Mas uh, Fukushima Masanori, who had fought and were loyal to Hideyoshi um, and, you know, at least still respected the Toyotomi clan name, even if they weren't particularly loyal to uh, Hideyori. Um, so in 1614, Ieyasu uses um, the, there's a, a, a great bell in a temple, Hokoji, I believe, in uh, Osaka that is recast. And there's an inscription that, you know, when read a certain way, splits Ieyasu's, uh, the characters that make up Ieyasu in, in Japanese. And uh, the uh, Ieyasu claims offense at this. This is an intentional, and in that uh, Hideyoshi is is rallying um, followers to his side to to push his claim. And whether it's true or not, and of course it's ridiculous, kind of on the face of it. But um, Ronin, that is masterless samurai, who um, you know basically because you have since the Tokugawa clan is the winner. And underneath him, like the next tier down, you have all the, the all the clans that have supported the Tokugawa for time immemorial. Um, and then you have all the losers, and when the losers' clans get disbanded, all the samurai that serve them suddenly are unemployed. They don't have jobs, they become ronin. So the lot of them, uh, of this group, are sort of migrating to Osaka, where Hideyori is based. And, um, you know, they're kind of they're basically rolling the dice on one last gamble. Like there's, there, there's no chance for them. They're, they were born warriors. They belong to this age of warriors. Uh, um, there's essentially a de facto peace, even if it isn't, you know, completely 
in the hands of uh, the Tokugawa. And so they roll the dice with uh, Hideyori, and of course it's it's not a it's not a fair fight. Um, I mean, to their credit, I mean they do have a defensive advantage because they are holding Osaka and Osaka Castle. If you remember, uh, was where they famously held off uh, the Iko Iki held off uh, Oda Nobunaga and his forces for several uh, years. Um, but unfortunately, basically what happens is there's uh, a spring and a winter campaign. Um, there's the winner, I think, believes comes first. And uh, there's basically a showdown, a stalemate. Uh, Ieyasu doesn't really attack, um, but he negotiates a peace. And part of the peace agreement is that the defenders of Osaka have to fill in uh, their moats. And of course, as soon as this is done, um, you know, a, a, a little bit of time passes and then it's like, okay, they attack, the moats are filled. Um, it's much easier for the attackers to win. Um, and that's precisely what happens. The, the, defend, the, the defenders of the Toyotomi are massacred. Um, and um, that about does it all up. I mean, that's, that's sort of the last gasp of any sort of challenge to, or at least any uh, chance for the, the country to slip back into war uh, and sort of restart sort of what defines the Sengoku period. And recently, there's been more some more interest in this in this particular um, period because of interest in Sonata Yukimura. Um, there was a taiga drama. So every year in Japan, there's a, the, the the state television channel in Japan, NHK, does a taiga drama, which is a period piece. And you know, it's not always based in the Sengoku period, but a lot of them are based in the Sengoku period. And one that was done very recently was about Sonata Yukimura. And it's been, you know, centered around basically his conflict with the Ieyasu and his defending uh, Osaka uh, Castle and these sort of, the, those last two, sie the sieges of, of, of Osaka. And, you know, there was this huge cash in. Again, if you play the Nobunaga's Ambition games, if you played um, in the Samurai Warriors video game and stuff like that, like, um, a lot of content has been made, particularly for Senator Yukimura. But again, I kind of want to emphasize that this was not particularly um, even fight. <laughs> I mean, it was certainly decisive in that it put a period at the end of the sentence in terms of the Sengoku period. But um, yeah, I mean, the whole cultural thing in Japan about sort of uh, honorable losers, I guess. Um, but again, you know, if you look at it from in terms of, you know, the, what changes between winter and spring, the breakup of, uh, uh, you know, the filling up of the moats and using that, you know, Ieyasu really comes to power through dishonorable victory. Um, so really that's all I have to say on the matter is I'm not a big fan of him. Um, so finally, this is done. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the videos. Uh, you know, I don't think there's going to be any problem using them. You know, if anything, I'm giving free advertising for a game that's been out for several years at this point. Um, I'm going to be featured, or rather my voice is going to be featured in a Samurai Archives podcast that's coming up. Um, I'm basically reading um, sort of like an informal essay I did about a dissertation that someone else did about Yusuji Kenshin. Um, so listen for that, and of course, always support the podcast. Give them money. Go to their um, if you go to their website, click on their Amazon link. Go buy books about feudal Japan or the Yakuza or whatever nerdy stuff that you like. Um, I'm all for it. Um, so my my next video will probably be about Kenshin. Um, I'll kind of you know piggyback off what I did um, in, the, in the in the podcast that's coming out, but with you know visual aids, maybe more videos like what I used before. Um, but let me know if you like it or not. Um, sorry, this has been such a sort of casual coffee talk, me rambling about history and Ieyasu and Sakagahara and so on. Um, but it's been a long day, 
and <laughs> it's been a long week. Um, so happy Saturday to all of you, and see you next time. Bye.